My name is Daniel Fontenot, and welcome to Jewels of Truth. Let us pray and ask the Lord to open our eyes that we may behold wondrous things out of his law. Our great and holy Father in heaven, as we again take up this study of the first and the last towers of Babel, we pray for the guidance and the inspiration of thy Holy Spirit to guide in this presentation. We pray that everything that is uh, said will be to your honor and glory and for the salvation of many souls. We pray, Lord, that you would open our eyes and anoint our eyes with ISAB, that heavenly ISAB, that we may comprehend the deep things of God. As we study this uh, chapter, uh, Jeremiah chapter 50, we pray, dear Heavenly Father, that you would uh, give us fresh glimpses into the future so that we may be pre better prepared for the great crisis and the coming of the Son of Man in the clouds of heaven. We pray and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Welcome again to Jewels of Truth. And uh, this is part 11 in the series, The First and the Last Towers of Babel. And today we will start uh, the study of uh, Jeremiah chapter 50. Actually, Jeremiah chapter 50 and 51, although today we, we, will, we won't get very far into chapter 50. But ultimately, when we get to the end of chapter 51, we will discover once again that the river Euphrates has a lot to do with uh, the first and the last towers of Babel. So let's begin at uh, Jeremiah 50 verses 1 and 2. And uh, you know the backdrop to all of this would be uh, Daniel chapter 5 and uh, the story about, about Belshazzar. And eventually we will get to Daniel chapter 5. So, Jeremiah 50, verses 1 and 2 states, The word that the Lord spake against Babylon and against the land of the Chaldeans by Jeremiah the prophet, Declare ye among the nations, and publish, and set up a standard, published. Conceal not, say, Babylon is taken, Bel is confounded, Merodach is broken in pieces, her idols are confounded, her images are broken in pieces. So first I want to uh, address, at least to, a, uh, to some extent, the word standard in verse 2, because it says, set up a standard. The word standard in the original uh, Hebrew uh, means a flag, also a sail, by implication a, a flagstaff, generally a signal, figuratively a token, banner, pole, sail, ensign, standard. And that word comes from another Hebrew word, uh, and, it's, and it means to gleam from afar, that is to be conspicuous as a signal, or rather perhaps a denominative from 52-51 and identical, and identical with 52-63 through the idea of a flag as fluttering in the wind to raise a beacon, lift up as an ensign, standard bearer. So, and that word standard, ironically, is the same word as ensign in, Ze in Zechariah 9 and verse 6. Zechariah 9 and verse 6. Oh, wait a minute here. 916, I'm sorry, 916. 916. And the Lord their God shall save them in that day as the flock of his people, for they shall be as the stones of a crown lifted up as an ensign upon his land. Now, I didn't get very much into it as far as in this study is concerned because it, it wasn't completely my focus. But I hope we all understand here that whenever Jeremiah is saying to set up a standard, okay, that it is inclusive of the ensign in the last days, whether you're speaking about the Sabbath, 
God's people, lifting up Christ, all of these, and maybe some more. So that's what this chapter begins with, the issue of the Sunday law, the Sunday Sabbath issue. Okay, so at that time, during the loud cry, a standard is to be set up among the nations. Okay, and we have this statement from Great Controversy, page 605. This is the chapter dealing with the Sunday law crisis. The Sabbath will be the great test of loyalty, for it is the point of truth especially controverted. When the final test shall be brought to bear upon men, then the line of distinction uh, will be drawn between those who serve God and those who serve Him not. While the observance of the false Sabbath in compliance with the law of the state, contrary to the fourth commandment, will be an avowal of allegiance to a power that is in opposition to God, the keeping of the true Sabbath in obedience to God's law is an evidence of, of loyalty to the Creator. While one class, by accepting the sign of submission to earthly powers, receive the mark of the beast, the other, choosing the token of allegiance to divine authority, receive the seal of God. And you notice I have the word token bolded there, and the word standard. If you go back to the uh, definition above, one of the definitions of that word standard is a token. So saying lift up the Sabbath, okay, set up the Sabbath, however you want to say it. There's a lot more that could be said about that, but we're going to continue on. Now notice it says that uh, this message is to be declared among the nations, okay, it says declare ye among the nations. This is in perfect harmony with Revelation 14, 6, where it says, and I saw another angel come down from heaven. No. And I saw another, another angel flying in the midst of heaven, uh, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto every nation and kindred and tongue and people. Okay? So the first angel's message, the first, second, and third angel's messages are involved in this statement in Jeremiah 50 and verse 6. Declare ye among the nations. What do we declare among the nations? the first, second, and third angels' messages. And that's really, to put it lightly, in a, in a very general manner. Declare the first, second, and third angels' messages. The three-step testing process, the acceptance of which means life or death. The acceptance or rejection of it means life or death. Okay, and then it says, publish and conceal not. Again, Jeremiah 50 and verse 2 states, Publish and conceal not. What is it saying that we should publish? That's a broad subject in and of itself. And conceal not. Well, consider this. Review and Herald, November 5th, 1903 states, We are not to conceal the truth for this time. It is to stand forth in its power and purity. The trumpet is to give a certain sound, for there are those who, though they have long known the truth, need to be awakened. They have closed their eyes to the result of walking contrary to the light that God has given. Now this is speaking to Seventh-day Adventists. It is speaking to Seventh-day Adventist ministers. We are not to conceal the truth for this time. Publish and conceal not. Conceal not what? What are we not to conceal? All right. Great Controversy, page 606 to 607 states, Thus the message of the third angel will be proclaimed. As the time comes for it to be given with greatest power, the Lord will work through humble instruments, leading the minds of those who consecrate themselves to His service. The laborers will be qualified rather by the unction of His Spirit than by the training of literary institutions. Men of faith and prayer will be constrained to go forth with holy zeal, declaring the words which God gives them. The sins of Babylon will be laid open. Let me repeat the words of Jeremiah. Publish and conceal not. So at, at the time of the 
I mean, we are to be giving the message all along the way, but especially at the time of the Sunday Law crisis, we are we are to publish and conceal not that this and and con, and not conceal the sins of Babylon, because it says here the sins of Babylon will be laid open. The fearful results of enforcing the observance of the church by civil authority, the inroads of spiritualism. Yeah, the inroads of spiritualism. That includes the UN. Okay, that's not, it's not just the UN. I, I, I realize that. But you have all kinds of inroads of spiritualism in this country. One, this thinking of it at the top of my head is yoga has become a commonplace, what do you call it? An exercise? It's a bunch of foolishness, and Americans even should know better. There was a time in this country where that just didn't even exist, and then it became rare. Now it's become just commonplace. And that's just one of the things. You know, spiritualism, there's, hard, there's almost no one that teaches the truth about the state of the dead. You know, it's all over the movies. It's just commonplace. Uh, earth worship, nature worship on and on and on, the stealthy but rapid progress of the papal power. The papal power has, has been stealthy but rapid in, in its progress. At this time in this nation, the cry is going out there, and I understand how people could say this, you know, China is a terrible threat to this country. That's what people are saying, especially among the conservatives and the republicans in this country but the papal power you know there was a time when 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 catholicism was abhorred in this country but then eventually we got used to it you know americans got used to catholicism in this country and so now we're at the point where people they're not concerned about catholicism anymore they're not concerned about the pope all all will be unmasked. Okay, this is again echoing the words. Publish and, and set up a standard. Publish and conceal not. By these solemn warnings the people will be stirred. Thousands upon thousands will listen who have never heard words like these. In amazement they hear the testimony that Babylon is the church. This is the message that we are not to conceal. In amazement they hear the testimony that Babylon is the church, fallen because of her errors and sins, because of her rejection of the truth sent to her from heaven. As the people go, for, go to their former teachers with the eager inquiry, are these things so? The ministers present fables, prophesy smooth things to soothe their fears and quiet the awakened conscience. And I can even imagine, not, not just among the apostate Protestant ministers, but even among the Seventh-day Adventist ministers, because decades ago, the General Conference president, uh, president said that as far as our attitude as Seventh-day Adventist toward the papacy, that has been relegated to the historical trash heap. So I can imagine during the Sunday Law crisis, people will come to Seventh-day Adventist and say, Are this, is this really true? That, this, that the... Uh, the Catholic Church is the, is the whore of revelation and uh, that it has changed the Sabbath from Saturday, from the seventh day to the, to the first day of the week and that she has persecuted God's people during the Dark Ages and was responsible for a hundred million deaths during the Dark Ages and on and on and on. Yeah, Seventh-day Adventist ministers will say, no, no, we, we don't believe that anymore. That's been relegated to the historical trash heap. The ministers present fables, prophesy smooth things to soothe their fears and quiet the awakened conscience. But since many refuse to be satisfied with the mere authority of men and demand they plain thus saith the Lord, the popular ministry like the Pharisees of old, filled with anger as their authority is questioned, will denounce the message as of Satan 
the message that we are not to conceal and stir up the sin-loving multitudes to revile and persecute those who proclaim it, who publish it. So going on on the same thought, the truth that we are not to conceal, but we are to publish it. A few pages later in Great Controversy, page 609, it states, The same trials have been experienced by men of God in past ages. Wycliffe, Huss, Luther, Tyndale, Baxter, Wesley urged that all doctrines be brought to the test of the Bible and declared that they would renounce everything which had command, uh, condemned. Against these men, persecution raged with relentless fury, yet they ceased not to declare the truth. Different periods in the history of the church have each been marked by the development of some special truth. I should have bolded the word special truth there, because this is the truth that we are not to conceal, but we are to publish, adapted to the necessity of God's people at that time. Every new truth, which we are to publish, has made its way against hatred and opposition. Those who were blessed with his light were tempted and tried. The Lord gives a special truth for the people in an emergency. Who dare refuse to publish it? He commands his servants to present the last invitation of mercy to the world. They cannot remain silent except at the peril of their souls. God's ambassadors have nothing to do with consequences. They must perform their duty and leave the results with God. The Great Controversy 609. Here's another, another one dealing with the same subject, something that we are to publish and not conceal. This is from te uh, Testimonies to Ministers, Testimonies to Ministers, page 117 to 118. A message that will arouse the churches is to be proclaimed, published. Every effort is to be made to give the light not only to our people, but to the world. <laughs> you know, there are some Seventh-day Adventists that have this idea. Well, the writings of Ellen White, the Spirit of Prophecy, they are for the remnant church, but, you know, they, they want to hide it from the world, you know. We're embarrassed that we have a prophet. But this says we are to give the light not only to our people, but to the world. I have been instructed that the prophecies of Daniel and the Revelation should be printed in small books with the, necess with the necessary explanations and should be sent where? To all, uh, all over the world. Our own people need to have the light placed before them in clearer lines. The vision that Christ presented to John, presenting the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus, is to be definitely proclaimed, published, to all nations, notice nations, because this message in Jeremiah is, declare ye among the nations, and peoples, and tongues. The churches, represented by Babylon, are represented as having fallen from their spiritual state to become a persecuting power against those who keep the commandments of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. To John, this persecuting power is represented as having horns like a lamb, but speaking like a dragon. As we near the close of time, there will be greater and still greater external parade of heathen power heathen deities will manifest their signal power and will exhibit themselves before the cities of the world. If you don't know this, you need to know that that has already happened. Just one example, just one example, is how seven, several decades ago, back in the 1950s at least, you had the, the image of Fatima that was paraded through North Vietnam. Read the book by Avril Manhattan. Vietnam, Why Did We Go? They caused thousands of North Vietnamese to go to the South. And they did it with this heathen deity 
the image of Fatima being paraded through the streets all over the place. Yeah, heathen deities will manifest their signal power and will exhibit themselves before the cities of the world. And this delineation has already begun to be fulfilled. By a variety of images, the Lord Jesus represented to John the wicked character and seductive influence of those who have been distinguished for their persecution of God's people. Brothers and sisters, there is no power that is so distinguished as the papacy is for its persecution of God's people. People can talk all they want about, say, well, you had Protestant churches that were, you know, uh, killing people, persecuting people during, you know, uh, the 1600s, the 1400s, maybe, but, but they learned that from Rome, okay? The papacy is more distinguished for its persecution of God's people than any other power on the face of the earth, even more than communism has. All need wisdom carefully to search out the mystery of iniquity, which is the papacy, that figures so largely in the winding up of this earth's history. All, now, all need wisdom carefully to search out out the mystery of iniquity that figures so largely in the winding up of this earth's history. In the very time in which we live, 2021, the Lord has called his people and has given them a message to bear. What is that message? He has called them to expose the wickedness of the man of sin. Listen, brothers and sisters, the very idea of Seventh-day Adventist leaders, so-called leaders, having meetings with the, with the leaders of the papacy are sending a gold medal to the Pope of Rome. I don't care if you do have the little logo there of the three angels flying in the midst of heaven. I don't care. The very idea of the leader of the Religious Liberty Department back in the 80s giving a medal to the Pope of Rome is disgusting. They should, they should have been exposing the wickedness of the man of sin who has made the Sunday law a distinctive power, who has thought to change times and laws and to oppress the people of God who stand firmly to honor him by keeping the only Sabbath, the only true Sabbath, the Sabbath of creation, as holy unto the Lord. Another part of Jeremiah 50 and verse 2 says that Babylon is taken, Baal is confounded, Merodach is broken in pieces. I am sure there's a lot more just to that phrase than what I'm seeing but we'll address it as much as we can. According to this, and I have, I have presented this little fact, uh, I think it was in the first uh, presentation of this series, part one. According to the Seventh-day Adventist Bible Commentary, the Tower of Babel was built in seven stages, having on top of the seventh stage a shrine dedicated to the god Marduk. Merodach, which is the one mentioned in Jeremiah 50 in verse 2, Merodach is the Babylonian god Marduk. Bel is the same as Baal and was the popular name for Marduk. Marduk is the god of gold, which Belshazzar and his thousand lords worshipped in Daniel chapter 5. Bell is confounded, okay? Bell is confounded. This should take us right back, and we'll read it again, even though we've read it many times before, to Genesis chapter 11, verses 7 through 9. Genesis 11, 7, or rather, yeah, Genesis 11, verses 7 through 9. 
go to, the Lord said, let us go down and there confound their language. Remember, Baal is confounded. Let us, let us go down and there confound their language that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from thence upon the face of all the earth, and they left off to build the city. Therefore is the name of it called Babel, because the Lord did there confound the language of all the earth. And from thence did the Lord scatter them abroad upon the face of all the earth. So this is definitely connected with the first tower of Babel. And the God of, so when it says uh, Merodach or Marduk is confounded, um, I'm sorry, is, is broken in pieces is, is what it says, broken in pieces, this should take us, as far as gold is concerned, to James chapter 5. James chapter 5. Verses 1 through 6. Go to now, ye rich men, weep and howl for your miseries that shall come upon you. Your riches are corrupted, and your garments are moth-eaten. Your what? Your gold and silver is cankered, and the rust of them shall be a witness against you, and shall eat your flesh as it were fire. Ye have heaped treasure together for the last days. Behold, the hire of the laborers who have reaped down your fields, which is of you kept back by fraud, crieth, and the cries of them which have reaped are entered into the ears of the Lord of Sabaoth. Ye, ye have lived in pleasure on the earth and have been wanton. Ye have nourished your hearts as in a day of slaughter. Ye have condemned and killed the just, and he doth not resist you. This would be during the Sunday law crisis the persecution. <laughs> and then it says, Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husbandman waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth, and hath long patience for it, until he receive the early and latter rain. Okay, so at that time we are to be patient unto the coming of the Lord. And I want us to remember here that Marduk is the god of gold, which Belshazzar and his thousand lords worshipped in Daniel chapter 5. I didn't put it here in the notes, but let's turn to Daniel chapter 5. We won't be addressing all of Daniel 5 today. That's down the road somewhat. But let's just emphasize this. There in verse 4, they, Belshazzar and his thousand lords, they drank wine and praised the gods of gold and of silver, of brass, of iron, of wood, and of stone. We're going to address that later, but suffice it to say that they worship the god of gold, Marduk. Now, Jeremiah 50, go back to Jeremiah chapter 50. And verse 3, For out of the north there cometh up a nation against her, which shall make her land desolate, and none shall dwell therein. They shall remove, they shall depart, both man and beast. So, question. When it says, For out of the north there cometh up a nation, who is it that comes out of the north? Now, it cannot be Babylon. Normally, when we think of someone coming out of the north, we think of Babylon. Because Babylon, you know, the king of Babylon is the king of the north. We know that. For Babylon is, it can't be the king of Babylon. Because for Babylon is the one being addressed in the message. Jer Jer Jeremiah, chapter 50, Jer Jer Jeremiah chapter 50. Someone's coming out, a nation is coming up out of the north, to destroy Babylon. Who defeated and destroyed Babylon? What nation comes against Babylon and makes her land desolate? Well, we know from Daniel chapter 2, let's read those verses to just make sure we know what we're talking about. Daniel chapter 2, verses 36 through 39. 
This is the dream, Daniel told Nebuchadnezzar, and we will tell the interpretation thereof before the king. Thou, O king, art a king of kings, for the God of heaven hath given thee a kingdom, power, and strength, and glory. And wheresoever the children of men dwell, the beast of the field and the fowls of, of heaven hath he given into thine hand, and hath made thee ruler over them all. Thou art this head of gold. This is Nebuchadnezzar's Babylon. Okay? And it is interesting to me that Babylon is known as the head of, is, it's the head of gold in Daniel chapter 2. There's other evidences in the scriptures that it is the head of gold. But it's interesting to me in light of that, that on the top of the Tower of Babel was this shrine dedicated to, to Marduk, which was the god of gold. Then we have Daniel chapter 7, okay, well, no, we, we didn't finish reading this, these verses here. Daniel chapter 2, verse 39, And after thee shall arise another kingdom inferior to thee. Okay, so then you go to Daniel chapter 7. Daniel chapter 7, and verses 1 through 5. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream and visions of his head upon his bed, then he wrote the dream and told the sum of the matters. Daniel spake and said, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of the heaven strove upon the great sea, and four great beasts came up from the sea, diverse one from another. The first was like a lion and had eagle's wings, and we know this is Babylon. I beheld till the wings thereof were plucked. And it was lifted up from the earth, and made stand upon the feet as a man, and a man's heart was given to it. And behold, another beast, a second, like unto a bear, and it raised up itself on one side, and it had three ribs in the mouth of it between the teeth of it. And they, ha they said thus unto it, Arise, devour much flesh. We know from history that Medo-Persia is the kingdom which destroyed Babylon. Okay, but now the question comes, what nation comes against modern Babylon? If you had a nation from the north come against Babylon, the king, it was, the, the, the Seventh-day Adventist Bible Commentary tells us that, that, that the Medo-Persian kingdom the Medo-Persian Medo army came from the north to attack Babylon. But what about at the end of the world? What nation? Because, because Jeremiah chapter 50, Jeremiah chapter 50 is not only for the times in which Jeremiah lived, but more for our time, the spirit of prophecy tells us. Well, let's read the whole article of Signs of the Times. It's not a very long article. Signs of the Times, December 29th, 1890. And the title of that article is A Symbol of the Final Destruction. Behold, I will stir up the Medes against them. This is how Sister White begins this article. Which shall not regard silver, and as for gold, they shall not delight in it. Their bows also shall dash the young people men to pieces, and they shall have no pity on the fruit of the womb. Their eyes shall not spare children. And Babylon, the glory of kingdoms, the beauty of the Chaldees' excellency, shall be as when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. The destruction of Babylon pictures to some degree the final destruction of the world of which the prophet writes. So, Sister White is clear here now that the destruction of Babylon pictures, or you can say because a picture is a representation of the end of the world, the final destruction of the world, of which the prophet writes, Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, both cruel and with wrath and fierce anger, to lay the land desolate, and he shall destroy the sinners thereof out of it. So let me repeat the destruction of Babylon represents the end of the world, Sister White tells us. This should easily take us to Revelation chapter 16 and verse 12 and onward. All right? 
All of these words there in Jeremiah chapter 50 and 51 are, are more for us than for the times in which Jeremiah lived. Cyrus and his army marched up the bed of the river Euphrates. And who does Cyrus represent? Does he not represent Christ to some degree? Cyrus and his army marched up the bed of the river Euphrates, for trenches had been dug and the river turned from its course. There, there is, brothers and sisters, there is so much meaning in these verses, in these statements from the spirit of prophecy. She's stating that which happened actually happened. The river turned from its course. And we're told in Revelation 16, we're going, to, we're going to address this again later. We're told in Revelation that the rivers of the Euphrates were dried up, that the way of the kings of the, of the east may be, might be prepared. And the, the river Euphrates was turned from its course. The river representing waters. I mean, I mean it's the people, because it's waters, because Revelation 17 Revelation 17, I, th I think it's verse 15, tells us that the, the waters are multitudes, they're people, nations, so on and so forth, so that there was no obstruction to their entering the city, provided the gates were opened. The guardsmen were indulging in merriment and revelry, and the city was left without defense. Before the officers were aware, the enemy had entered the city, and escape was impossible. Those in one part of the city were slain or captured before those in another part knew that the city was invaded. Isn't that, that's just horrifying. Those in one part of the city were slain or captured before those in another part knew that the city was invaded. You're sitting there, or you're standing there, you're just having a good old time, not knowing that in another part of the city, the people are being slaughtered. No alarm was sounded. No cry could be raised to warn the people that the forces of Cyrus were upon them. This is representing the coming of Christ. People not being prepared for the coming of Jesus Christ in the clouds of heaven. The monarch, his princes, and guardsmen were giving up to feasting and intoxicated with strong drink. They knew nothing of the peril of the kingdom. There was a noise out of the palace gates. The doors were forced open. The troops of Cyrus rushed in, and in a short time the king and his guests were lying mangled in the heaps of the slain, and the drunken slept a perpetual sleep. This is perpetual in the greatest sense of the word, you know, until the second death. I mean, but I mean, at the end of the world, the drunken, those drunken with the wine of Babylon, whenever they are slain, whenever they are destroyed, they, are, they sleep a perpetual death. Thus was the prophecy of Isaiah and Jeremiah fulfilled to the very letter. There was a discussion months ago about what does it mean, fulfilled to the very letter? According to the reasoning of some, apparently Isaiah and Jeremiah's prophecies weren't fulfilled to the, to the very letter. Sounds like the very letter to me. Note, concerning feasting and intoxicated with strong drink, see Matthew 24. Let's go to Matthew chapter 24. Verses 44 to 51. This is picturing the same subject, brothers and sisters. Watch therefore, for ye know not what hour your Lord doth come. But know this, that if the good man of the house had known in what watch the thief would come, he would have watched and would not have suffered his house to be broken up. Where does it say somewhere in that previous passage? Um, trying to find it here. The guardsmen were 
were unaware the enemy had entered the city and escape was impossible. Um, I know I saw the word thief earlier. She compared uh, Medo-Persia with Cyrus at their head coming in like a thief. We'll just go continue on there, but I know I, I know I saw it. Anyway, so continuing on, verse 44 of, of, uh, Rev, uh, of uh, Matthew chapter 24. Matthew 24, verse 44. Therefore be ye also ready, for in such an hour as ye think not, the Son of Man cometh. Who then is a faithful and wise servant, whom his Lord hath made ruler over his household, to give them meat in due season. What is meat in due season, brothers and sisters? It is present truth. And Sister White tells us clearly that if a minister is not preaching present truth, he is saying to the people, My Lord delayeth his coming. Blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. Verily I say unto you that he shall make him ruler over all his goods. But, and if that evil servant shall say in his heart, My Lord delayeth his coming, and shall begin to smite his fellow servants, and to eat and drink with the drunken, the Lord of that servant shall come in a day when he looketh not for him, and in an hour that he is not aware of, and shall cut him asunder, and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. <clears throat> and then, of course, Revelation 14.8 and uh, Revelation 18.3. Revelation 14.8, the second angel's message, states... And there followed another angel saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And then 18, Revelation 18 and verse 3, for all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. All right, all of these. This is the feasting and intoxicated with strong drink, the wine of Babylon, accepting and drinking in the false doctrines that Babylon is famous for. The prophet describes Babylon as the glory of kingdoms, and in the dream of Nebuchadnezzar it was represented by the head of gold. But although it was the greatest kingdom of the earth, the prophet had declared, I will rise up against them, saith the Lord of hosts, and cut off from Babylon the name and remnant and son and nephew, saith the Lord. I will also make it a possession for the bittern and pools of water, and I will sweep it with the besom of, of destruction, saith the Lord of hosts. Through the prophet Isaiah, the Lord declares what shall come upon those who pursue a similar course to that of the despisers of his word. See how Ellen White is paralleling the Medes and the Persians coming to destroy Babylon with the second coming of Christ. Through the prophet Isaiah, the Lord declares what shall come upon those who pursue a similar course to that of these despisers of his word. He says, the noise of a multitude in the mountains, like uh, as of a great people, a tumultuous noise of the ki kingdoms of nations gathered together. The Lord of hosts mustereth the host of the battle. I hope that you all take the time, just with that phrase, the Lord of hosts mustereth the host of the battle. The next presentation, if I remember and do not forget, I will put in there, I will connect with this, uh, volume 8 of the testimonies, pages 41 and 42, because right there, and the, the, the name of that uh, chapter in volume 8 of the testimonies is entitled, uh, A View of the Conflict. And there is definitely pictured the Lord of hosts mustering the host of the battle. 
They come from a far country, from the end of heaven, even the Lord and the weapons of his indignation to destroy the whole land. Howl ye, for the day of the Lord is at hand. It shall come as a destruction from the Almighty. He looks down the ages and declares what shall be. Therefore shall all hands be faint, like Belshazzar's, and every man's heart shall melt, and they shall be afraid. Pangs and sorrows shall take hold of them. They shall be in pain as a woman that travaileth. They shall be amazed one at another. Their faces shall be as flames. Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, cruel both with wrath and fierce anger, to lay the land desolate. And that's exactly what the Lord does at his second coming. The land of all the earth is laid desolate, and he shall destroy the sinners thereof out of it. The prophet then describes the signs of the day of God. And Christ also speaks of these signs as tokens of his near coming. For the stars of heaven and the constellations thereof shall not give their light. The sun shall be darkened in his going forth, and the moon shall not give her light to shine. And I will punish the world for their evil, and the wicked for their iniquity. And I will cause the arrogancy of the proud to cease, and will lay low the haughtiness of the terrible. I will make a man more precious than fine gold, even a man than the golden wedge of Ophir. Therefore I will shake the heavens, and the earth shall remove out of her place, in the wrath of the Lord of hosts, and in the day of his fierce anger. And I hope you understand here, I've been interspersing there, in, uh, uh, putting in some uh, uh, references and comments along the way as we've been reading through, through this article in the, the Signs of the Times. The last paragraph of that article from Signs of the Times states, Bab no, be before we read that last paragraph, I want to address again further the subject of God's army, okay? Because, and this is, again, let me just remind us in case we've forgotten now, Jeremiah chapter 50 and verse 3 <clears throat> states, Out of the north there cometh up a nation against her, okay, which shall make her land desolate, okay? So this nation, who is this nation? Joel chapter 2. Joel chapter 2. Verses 1 through 11. Blow the trumpet in Zion, and sound an alarm in my holy mountain, that all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord cometh, for it is nigh at hand, a day of darkness and of gloominess, a day of clouds and of thick darkness, as the morning spread over the mountains. A great people, who is this great people? And a strong, there hath not been ever the like, neither shall be any more after it, even to the years of many generations. A fire devoureth before them, and behind them a flame burneth. The land is as the garden of Eden before them, and behind them a desolate wilderness, yea, and nothing shall escape them. The appearance of them is as the appearance of horses and of horsemen, so shall they run, like the noise of chariots on the tops of mountains shall they leap, like the noise of a, of a flame of fire that devoureth the stubble, and as a strong people set in battle array, before their face the people shall be much pained, all faces shall gather blackness, they shall run like mighty men, they shall climb the wall like men of war, and they shall march every one on his ways, and they shall not break their ranks. Hmm, reminds me of 80, page 41. Neither shall one thrust another. They shall walk every one in his path, and when they shall fall upon the sword, they shall not be wounded. They shall run to and fro in the city. They shall run upon the wall. They shall climb up upon the houses. They shall enter in at the windows like a thief. 
the earth shall quake before them, the heavens shall tremble, the sun and the moon shall be dark, and the stars shall withdraw their shining. And the Lord shall utter his voice before his army, for his camp is very great, for he is strong that executeth his word. For the day of the Lord is great and very terrible, and who can abide it? I would encourage everyone, which by the time everyone watches this presentation, you, you can access the next presentation, because in that next presentation, part 12, I'm going to put the quote there from, uh, and I think I did there a while back, but I'm going to put it in here again in, in regards to this subject, uh, volume 8 of the Testimonies, page 41 and 42, because I think it's evident from all of these, from, from these scriptures, that the, God's army, at least in this sense, not like in the sense of Joel chapter 1. Uh, it doesn't appear like, it doesn't appear that the army in Joel chapter 2 is the same as the, that nation, well, okay, yeah, this is, <clears throat> I think Joel chapter 2, suffice it to say Joel chapter 2, uh, that army there has got to be the Lord's army. The Lord's army, God's people, that is. All right, continuing on here. So, what are the God's weapons of indignation? <clears throat> All right, Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 1, pages 84 and 85. The bowels of the earth are the Lord's arsenal, from which he drew forth the weapons he employed in the destruction of the old world, the innovation world. Waters in the bowels of the earth gushed forth and united with the waters from heaven to accomplish the work of destruction. Since the flood, God has used both water and fire in the earth as his agents to destroy wicked cities. In the day of the Lord, just before the coming of Christ, God will send lightnings from heaven in his wrath, which will unite with fire in the earth. The mountains will burn like a furnace and will pour forth terrible streams of lava, destroying gardens and fields, villages and cities. And as they pour their melted ore, rocks and heated mud into the rivers will cause them to boil like a pot and send forth massive rocks and scatter their broken fragments upon the land with indescribable violence. Whole rivers will be dried up, the earth will be convulsed, and there will be dreadful eruptions and earthquakes everywhere. God will plague the wicked inhabitants of the earth until they are destroyed from off it. The saints are preserved in the earth in the midst of these dreadful commotions, as Noah was preserved in the ark at the time of the flood. You know, and this is from Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 1, pages 84 and 85. You know, it speaks here of the, um, uh, where does it say it here? In the day of the Lord, just before the coming of Christ, God will send lightnings from heaven in his wrath, which will unite with fire in the earth. The mountains will burn like a furnace and will pour forth terrible streams of lava. What do you think could... Uh, be involved with all of this? Do you think that oil could be involved in all of this? I'll tell you what, brothers and sisters, those wicked people on this earth who are trying to stop the production of oil, if they knew that this was coming, they would, as fast as they possibly could, try to get all the oil out of this earth. But they don't know and they could know. All right, coming to a close in this, in this presentation. Testimonies, volume 5, page 208 and 209. I'm trying to see. Okay, yeah. All right, so the word fixed here. If you look in your notes here, back to the previous passage from Signs of the Times, the last paragraph of Signs of the Times, December 29th, 1890, Notice in that paragraph, it says, Babylon, well, let's just read from the beginning of the paragraph to where I want, 
us to be. Babylon is a symbol of the world at large. When its doom was made certain, its kings and officers seemed to be, to be as men insane. Did I skip that passage? Yeah, I think I surely did. I went from Joel chapter 2. Let me go back here. Before the last, we, we, we just read Spirit of Prophecy, volume 1, pages 84 and 85. I meant to read the last paragraph of Signs of the Times, December 29th, 1890, but I skipped over it. Let's go back to that. Babylon is a symbol of the world at large. When its doom was made certain, its kings and officers seemed to be as men insane. I've read this passage before, and now we have it again. And their course, their own course, hastened its destiny. This is what men, we know that those of us who are paying attention and do not have our heads in, in the sand, we know that the leaders of this country are acting like men insane, men and women insane, and their own course is hastening the, 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 the demise of this country. When, now notice, this is where I wanted to be at. When the doom of a nation is fixed, fixed, it seems that all the energy, wisdom, and discretion of its former time of prosperity deserts its men of position, and they hasten the evil they would avert. Outside enemies are not the greatest peril to an individual or a nation. The overthrow of a nation results, under the providence of God, from some unwise or evil course of its own. But the people who fear God, who are loyal to His laws, who carry out the principles of righteousness in their lives, have a sure defense. God will be the refuge of those who trust in Him. So, emphasis when it says, when the doom of a nation is fixed, okay? And at that time, the men just go, the, the leaders of the nation go insane. So, okay, now we go to volume five of the testimonies, starting at the bottom of page uh, five of you notes, from volume five of the testimonies. Of the Amorites, the Lord said, In the fourth generation they shall come hither again, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. Although this nation was conspicuous because of its idolatry and corruption, it had not yet filled up the cup of its iniquity, and God would not give command for its utter destruction. The people were to see the divine power manifested in a marked manner that they might be left without excuse. The compassionate Creator was willing to bear long with their iniquity until the fourth generation. Think of the fourth generation after the flood of Noah, during the time of the building of the Tower of Babel, Nimrod's temple. Think of the fourth generation, which is now the fourth generation after the flood of the papacy of the Dark Ages. Then, if no change was seen for the better, his judgments were to fall upon them. With unerring accuracy, the Infinite One still keeps an account with all nations. While His mercy is tendered with calls to repentance, this account will remain open. But when the figures reach a certain amount which God has fixed, the ministry of His wrath commences. Notice again the statement from the previous passage from Signs of the Time, December 29th, 1890, when the doom of a nation is fixed, it seems that all the energy, wisdom, and discretion of its former time of prosperity deserts its men in position, and they hasten the evil they would avert. So, in this passage from Volume 5, when the figures reach a certain amount which God has fixed, the ministry of His wrath commences. The account is closed, divine patience ceases, there is no more pleading of mercy in their behalf. The prophet, looking down the ages, had this time presented before his vision. The nations of this age have been the recipients of unprecedented mercies. The choicest of heaven's blessings have been given them, but increased pride, covetousness, idolatry, contempt of God, and base ingratitude are written against them. They are fast closing up 
their account with God. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 5, page 208 to 209. One thing that I haven't covered yet in regard to the subject matter in Jeremiah chapter 50, which I intend on covering in the next part of this series, is the subject of who is Babylon. Now, I believe that most of us in this movement have a pretty good understanding of who Babylon is, but I think we need to consider it further because in Great Controversy, well, the chapter entitled A Warning Rejected and the pages 381 to 384, I think, uh, give a good uh, explanation as to who Babylon is. And this is the Babylon that is, that is addressed in Jeremiah chapter 50. So we need to study those pages and we'll, we'll cover that the next time. I hope this was edifying to all who have listened, and I hope and pray that this will be a tool to prepare God's people for the great crisis and the coming of the Son of Man in the clouds of heaven. Let us pray. O oh, our gracious, holy Father in heaven, we thank you, Lord, for revealing to us these messages. We thank you for revealing to us things to come. We, we thank you for revealing to us the issues at the end of the world and the events to be tra that, that will transpire. And we pray, dear Heavenly Father, once again that these truths, this message, will not be uh, just a theory, but would, but would be a living reality to us that would uh, urge us to uh, prepare for the great crisis and the coming of the Son of Man in the clouds of heaven. We pray that you would bless this recording to your honor and glory and for the salvation of a multitude of souls. In the name of thy Son, Jesus Christ, we pray and we thank you. Amen.